Coming up on the bottom line, we're talking Google Android and Google Buzz with Seth Porges. Try GoToMeeting free for 30 days. Visit gotomeeting.com slash techpodcasts. There are several versions of the Android OS, OS out there right now. Each version has unique features, and now there's news that the Motorola Droid will soon be getting some features that you could only get on the Nexus One, but not all of them. They're not going to have the exact same feature set. My question to you is, do you think Android can survive if there's so many versions out there at one time? Absolutely. Right now, you know, there's kind of two schools of thought when it comes to mobile operating systems. You can either do the one device, one operating system, kind of packaged clump, monolithic mentality, which is what the iPhone has sort of pioneered, or we can do the split every which way, branching out, let a 10 different manufacturers and four different versions of the OS prosper in their own mentality, which Windows Mobile and now Android have done. And each has their pros and cons. With the uh, iPhone, the main thing though is you're kind of guaranteed whatever you get will work on the iPhone. Apple makes the operating system, they make the hardware, no question at all. But there's problems with that. You're stuck to one phone. If you don't like that phone, tough luck. If you don't like the, op the carrier, it's on AT&T in this case, tough luck. So it really limits consumer choice. You get guaranteed compatibility, but it comes at a price. Android, on the other hand, has taken a little bit more of an open approach. Lots of manufacturers make Android phones. Just about every character carrier has multiple Android phones. And with that, you're guaranteed to have some incompatibility across devices when you have different ways of inputting text. Some have keyboards, some don't. Different processors, different everything. However, it should be noted that iPhone OS right now, which up till now has sort of been this kind of monolithic thing, is kind of due for a branching of its own. Once the iPad comes out, the iPad's going to run iPhone software. There's going to be this issue, like will it be iPad-specific software that won't run on the iPhone? And then you have sort of a greater sort of splitting of sorts. So even the things right now that seem sort of monolithic are kind of due for splitting as things move into the next generation. What do you think that's going to do to developers? I mean, right now Android's got like I think six versions out there at one time. I think 1 1.5, 1 1.6, 2.1, 2.2. I don't know if there's even a 2.2 .2 yet, but there might be. Who knows what Google's got going. But I mean, do you think this stops developers from like wanting to go to this? I mean, at least for the Apple uh, model, you're going to have one of two choices, right? You're going to either go iPhone or iPad, and one is going to work with the other, and then one won't go the other way. But will this stop developers from doing Android stuff? Will it actually drive them to other mobile operating systems? I don't think so, especially look at the iPhone. Some programs only work on the 3GS, for example, because you need a video camera for them, like augmented reality programs. They won't work on an older iPhone. So I think really what's going to happen is developers are going to try new ideas for the functionality that's in the newer Android operating systems. And then once the older phones eventually get them or new phones come out, those you know, applications will get widespread. It kind of gives them a sort of neat way of sort of testing the waters with different products and different types of services. What do you think about the next one? I mean, Google has their own Android phone. Do you think this actually like makes other phone uh, manufacturers hesitate to put Android on there? I mean, how could they possibly do a good enough job when compared to Google? I mean, they made the operating system and they're going to have such a hand in the hardware with HTC. Do you think this stops people from actually using Android? Not at all, because especially, you know, the Google Nexus One didn't sell anywhere near as close to my phones as, say, the Motorola Droid, for example. It may have the Google name on it, but it's not the dominant uh, Android phone in the marketplace. I think, you know, it's, and to me, I don't really view the Nexus One as that different from any other Android phone. Maybe it has a couple new features, maybe the Google name is on it, but at its heart, it is an Android phone, and there really isn't anything about it that kind of discourages me where I, a developer or handset operator or handset manufacturer, from stepping into the Android pole. Do you think the general public even knows about any of this stuff? Do you think they yeah, even I care? Think, I think they're getting to more now. I think right now there's, especially as the problems with the iPhone become more and more prevalent, harder and harder to ignore. There's a large number of people who are looking for an iPhone alternative. I think it's especially true for people who are bound by contract operators that don't have the iPhone. They like the iPhone. They want iPhone-like um, you know, processes. They want cool apps. They want fun phones. And there's not that many choices until you get to Android phones. I think people on Verizon, people on Sprint, people on T-Mobile in particular are really hungry for these powerful Android devices because they give them sort of the iPhone experience without, you know, leaving their carrier. Let's veer off a little bit off topic. Let's talk about Google Buzz. I mean, this came out today. Yes. Uh, could you try to explain this to me? Because from what I can tell, it looks like they, that Google took part of Google Wave and they crammed it into Gmail, and it seems like it's kind of like a status update, live updating thing. I tr explained this earlier in a nice written piece. I'm having a hard time figuring out exactly what they're trying to do. Do you have a handle on this? I think I do. Of course, I could be wrong because it is, you know, they announced out like 20 minutes ago. Um, basically, what's happened is Google has been very prominent in, in saying that they view email as it currently exists as sort of an antiquated mode of technology. 
Email's been around for decades, has barely changed. And so with Google Wave initially, a couple months ago, what they were trying to do is sort of bring email into 21st century with sort of real-time updates, multimedia processes, the ability to jam widgets in there. It kind of doesn't really work for most people, though. It's good if you're, you know, there are usage scenarios for businesses or for people who are constantly talking to each other, which is great. But for the average back and forth between somebody, email is still a much more practical option. So what instead they did is they took sort of some of the top end features of Google Wave and they kind of crammed it into Gmail, as you said, and in doing so, they kind of turned Gmail into a bit of a social network. They're kind of facebook of a fine Gmail. And I think what Google's found is that social networks are a huge, huge sector of the internet now, and they're really not involved in them. They tried putting out Orkut a couple of years ago, but it kind of bombed, except I guess for a couple of people in the Philippines and Brazil. And so what Google's trying to do now is they're realizing rather than starting up their own new social network, why don't we just turn Gmail into a social network? Yeah, in some respects. So they're kind of go ahead. So they're they're turning Gmail into a social network. They're giving you profiles, they're giving you Twitter and Facebook like status updates. They're giving you all these things you expect in a social network in a program you already have. Yeah, in some respects they have a real advantage. From what I can tell, you don't have to actually go out and try to find your friends. I mean, if you try to find somebody with a, a, a very common name like a John Smith via Facebook, it'll take you forever. And if it's already That's in your email address and your e email address book, and I think Google actually will automatically populate that for you. I mean, it seems like it's a bit of Facebook stuff. It seems like in some respects it's easier than Facebook or Twitter. And you don't have to worry about your like, um, what would you call them? These verified accounts because you know who these people are because you've been emailing them. So it seems Absolutely. like Absolutely. I understand it. Yeah, my understanding is as soon as somebody emails you in Gmail, you're automatically added as a friend. I don't know if that's a good thing or not, though, because what's part of what's good about Twitter and Facebook is you can choose who you follow. And if the default setting is the follow and friend, I think that might turn off some people. I need to learn a little bit more about how that works. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're in, the, uh, in, in the press business. We get a lot of press releases. I mean, you don't necessarily want to follow everybody who sends you, hey, check out my newest widget. And you're like, oh, great, there's kids <laughs> They're having a birthday friend. party. Yeah, yeah it, it's because they may correspond with you more than you correspond with them. So I guess we really have to see how this thing actually works in practice. Uh, does your Gmail actually have it working right now? Yeah, um, almost immediately, you know, they're slowly rolling it out onto people's accounts. Some people's Gmails have it on there now. Basically, when you do, it'll just have, you know, it'll give you a window explaining what's new. And then underneath your inbox, there'll be a button that says Buzz in Gmail. And you click it, and it'll bring you to the Buzz interface. It looks a lot like, um, sort of like a Facebook page, kind of. Yeah, I, um, but I've got it now. Yeah. I agree with you. It's not, it kind of seems like Facebook to me because you can put in photos and videos. You're not limited to, I don't think there's a character limit either, is there? I, I don't think so. I'm not sure though. Right. So it seems like a lot like the Facebook status update in your Gmail. And I think one of the weirder things is where people did not understand Wave, they will understand it because it's now a, an actual like tab in, yes. in uh, Gmail. That's one of the weirder things. Like, oh, once I saw it in there, I'm like, oh, that makes more sense. Wave? Yeah, Wave, Wave wow. almost seems like a tech demo next to this. Wave was an example of what can be done. This is more of an example of what should be done. Right. And if you look at Gmail right. the past couple of years, um, you have your Gtalk list on the left side of the screen. And people use that little status thing as kind of a status message they do on Facebook and Twitter. People put on links, they put on what they're up to, and it just kind of freezes there. And I think Google realized it's a really powerful tool, and they're kind of trying to make that a more prominent part of the Gmail experience. All right, I think we're out of time. Uh, that, that, was, that was a lot of information. I'm, I'm really glad we got to somewhat, somewhat talk about Google Buzz while we had the time. Thanks to Seth Borges of PopularMechanics.com for showing up. Really appreciated that. Tomorrow on The Bottom Line, we're going to have a longer talk about Google Buzz because I'm going to figure it out and digest all of it by tomorrow. I'm Isaac Akhtar and thanks for watching. Use promo code AFTVSAVE and get 15% off any order over 75 bucks at CCS.com.